book of Revelation is the most amazing book of prophecy in all of the Bible. But people often say, but it's so complicated, it's so difficult to understand. No, it's not. I love teaching the book of Revelation. In fact, I've summarized the whole book in seven basic points in one message in less than one hour. I can teach you the whole book of Revelation in an hour. Give me an hour of your time, 56 minutes, and I'll help you understand what it's really all about. And the amazing thing about this message is it's available on DVD and in printed form as well. When we talk about John being on the island of Patmos, we'll go to the island of Patmos. When I talk about the letter to the church at Ephesus, we'll go to the ancient church of Ephesus. We'll see all of these sites that are mentioned, even the battle of Armageddon. We'll go to the fields of Armageddon itself. We'll take you on site, help you understand the message of the most important book in all of the Bible, Revelation in an hour. We can't put Dr. Heinzen's full hour-long study on our half-hour program today, but you can have it in its entirety on DVD and in an 80-page book for a gift of just $30 or more. Make your gift payable to The King is Coming, Box 907, Colton, California, 92324. To use your credit card, call 800-622-2767 or go to thekingiscoming.com. Last week on The King is Coming, Dr. Heinsohn took us through the first part of his study, Understanding Revelation in One Hour. Much of Revelation is a vision of the future. John tries to describe the indescribable, things that he'd never seen before as he is caught up by the Spirit of God and swept into the distant future to see the end of the world. To those churches that proclaim the gospel message of Christ who are faithful to the Lord, God sets before them an open door of opportunity and tells us that I will keep you then from the hour of trial that will come upon the whole world. And then out of the throne there proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, etc. The throne of God is the energy source of the universe. And then all of a sudden one of the elders said to me, Weep not. Very decisive in the Greek. It's like, John, stop it, man. Get a hold of yourself. Uh, stop crying. And he looks up through tear-stained eyes. And there he says, Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to pronounce the judgments. Today on The King is Coming, we have a very special treat. Today, Dr. Red Heinsohn concludes our whirlwind trip through his epic study, Understanding Revelation in One Hour. Prepare to understand the book of Revelation like you never have before. Don't ever let a liberal or a cultist try to say to you, Jesus never claimed to be God kind of the Da Vinci Code thing. Uh, he was just a simple, humble rabbi. Why the church came along later and tried to deify him. Really? Then why did Jesus say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father? Why did Jesus say, I and the Father are one? Why did Jesus say, I have the power to forgive your sins? I and the Pharisees said, who do you think you are? Only God can forgive sins. That was the whole point of the statement. At his trial before the high priest, when he was asked, are you the Messiah? Are you the Son of the Blessed One? Are you the Son of God, Jesus' answer was yes, and you'll see me coming in the future in the clouds, in power, and in great glory. No, Jesus shouts to you about his deity. The New Testament screams to us that Jesus is God. That's the whole point of this chapter. If Jesus is not God, you'd have to take Revelation 5 and rip it out of the Bible and throw it away. The whole point is, they worship God the Father as the Creator in chapter 4. They worship God the Son as the Redeemer in chapter 5. The problem is solved. Christ has appeared. And what does he do? He opens the seals on the scroll. And we move to point number four in our outline, the process of judgment that has to follow in chapters 6 through 11. The opening of the seven seals and the sounding of the seven trumpets. Look at chapter 6, verse 1. I watched as the Lamb opened one of the seals. Circle the word lamb. He's the one opening the seals, pronouncing the judgments. In verse 2, I saw a white horse, and he that sat upon him had a bow. I'd underline that, not a sword. This is not Christ. This is the imposter, the Antichrist. Uh, and he was given a crown. Uh, it's not the diadem of Christ. The Greek term is stephanos, the wreath of the victor. 
uh, and he went forth conquering to conquer. This isn't Jesus releasing himself. No, Jesus is releasing the judgments of the end times, and the first judgment is the white horse, the Antichrist. The second one in verse 4, the red horse of war to take peace from the earth that they might kill one another. And then in verse 5, he releases the black horse of devastation that follows the aftermath of war. And then in verse 8, he releases the pale horse of death and hell followed after him. You have the four horsemen of the apocalypse that are then released in this passage. It's the big picture, the overview of what's coming in the book of Revelation. The Antichrist is coming, war is coming, devastation is coming, death is coming, and then the details follow after that. You get in Revelation the wide-angle lens followed by the snapshots, the big picture followed by the details. Then in verse 9, he opens the fifth seal to reveal the martyrs who were slain for the Word of God during the time of tribulation, those that have been left behind after the rapture, who finally do come to faith in Christ but lose their lives. Uh, and then in verse 12, he opens the sixth seal, and there's a great earthquake. The sun becomes black. The moon becomes like blood. The stars seem to be falling. Why? Because of the earthquake. The planet is shaken by some dramatic event uh, in which the air is polluted. The sun is black and the moon is blood red. Uh, and uh, the stars seem to be moving because the planet is moving. What is all of this? It's the wrath of Christ against an unbelieving world. That's why the church is not here in these chapters because the church is not the object of the wrath of Christ. She's the object of the love of Christ. She may be the object of the wrath of the world, the wrath of Satan, the wrath of men, but not the wrath of Jesus. Uh, you don't have Jesus beating up the church in the tribulation period, beat up the bride and then take her home to the marriage at the end of the book. That doesn't make any kind of sense at all. No, he loved the church. He died for the church. He gave himself for the church. And he's coming again for the church. This message is a message of wrath for the unbelievers. And they know it's the wrath of God. And they still do not repent. Why? Because the great day of his wrath has come. And who will be able to stand? And then in chapter 8, verse 1, he opens the seventh seal, and there's silence in heaven, a holy hush, as there was in the temple before the sounding of the seven trumpets. Take your Bible and go to Revelation, the eighth chapter. Notice how it begins. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven, and then go to verse 2, and then afterwards, I saw seven angels that stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. So you might underline the seven trumpets. We go from the seven seals right into the seven trumpets. The angels come one after another in staccato fashion, blow the trumpets. These are trumpets of judgment for the world. This is not the last trumpet for the church. That occurred at the rapture. These are trumpets of judgment for the unbelievers that are left behind. Uh, trust me, you don't want to be left behind. Everything goes wrong. First, you're under the wrath of Christ, the Lamb, in the opening of the seals and in the sounding of the trumpets. And before we finish these sections, we'll discover in the book, you're under the wrath of the devil. And finally, you're under the wrath of God the Father. And when that wrath falls, it's all over. In verse 7, the first angel sounded his trumpet, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood cast upon the earth, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all of the grass was burned up. These terrible ecological disasters of the tribulation period are the worst things that will ever happen on planet Earth, and the Bible predicted them over 2,000 years ago. In verse 8, the second angel sounded, and the great mountain or ball of fire was cast into the sea, in the ocean and a third of the sea is polluted. And then in verse 10, the third angel sounds his trumpet, and a third of the rivers are polluted. The fresh water is polluted. Something is settling down over the planet. Is this radiation fallout? The Bible doesn't make that clear, but such a concept would have been unknown in the first century. What else could pollute fresh water and ocean water at the same time? 
And in verse 12, the fourth angel sounded his trumpet, and a third part of the sun and the moon and the stars were smitten, etc. Again, the Bible doesn't use the term, obviously, nuclear war. Uh, ancient people would never have understood that. But when we read the description of these judgments, while they could be cosmic in nature from the hand of God himself, you still read about armies marching, men fighting in the book of Revelation. The world is at war, and it sounds like nuclear war. Then he says in chapter 9, uh, verse 1, the fifth angel sounded his trumpet, uh, and an angel or a star fell from heaven who had the key to the bottomless pit and releases a plague of demons like a plague of locusts. Uh, the plague of demons are plaguing the unbelievers who've been left behind. And they have over them in verse 11 a commander, the angel of the bottomless pit, called Apollyon, destroyer. And don't think that Satan is the friend of the unbeliever. Satan hates the unbeliever. He wants them ultimately to suffer the devastations that are coming. He's plaguing the unbelievers that are left behind. Trust me, you don't want to be left behind. Everything will go wrong in the time of tribulation. And then go to verse 14. The sixth angel sounds his trumpet and says, Loose the four angels that are bound in the great river Euphrates that runs through the middle of Iraq. That tells us that the final conflicts of the end times will be centered in the Middle East. The fact that there's a crisis in the Middle East today should not surprise us. Every Middle Eastern crisis reminds us that it's only a precursor of the great crisis that is yet to come in the future. Uh, release the angel that is bound there in the river. Why? To prepare to slay a third part of men for a year and a month and a day and an hour. There is coming a war that will get out of control in the Middle East that will lead to death and devastation. He then tries to describe this massive army that is moving into the Middle East. Some speculate, is it Eastern nations intervening in the Middle East, or is this one last great jihad against the people of Israel? Now, I would remind you that uh, east of the Euphrates uh, is half of Iraq, all of Iran, Pakistan, Afghanistan, all of the Soviet stands, uh, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, etc., all of Indonesia, there are more Muslims uh, east of the Euphrates than there are west of the Euphrates. This could be one final jihad against the people of God themselves, but whatever it is, the Bible says it's out of control, and there are creatures that are described here that John can't even fully describe. Uh, they sound like horses, but they're covered with iron, and fire shoots out both ends of them, and they sound more like tanks than they do horses. Again, he's trying to describe the indescribable so that we'll understand these are the final judgments of the distant future. And then go to Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. The seventh angel sounds his trumpet. And there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Now, the very words that Handel writes into the oratorio of Handel's Messiah, and he shall reign forever and ever in the closing chorus. Heaven opens. In verse 19, the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in the temple the Ark of the Covenant. The ultimate Ark of the Covenant is in the heavenly temple. Heaven opens. Heaven is about to come to earth. It sounds like the book of Revelation is all over with. But all of a sudden, one of the great surprises in the book. Suddenly, the book of Revelation calls time out, if you will. And right in the middle of the book, we have point number five in our outline, the players in the great end times drama. It is as though there's a scorecard right in the middle of the book of Revelation that tells you who will be involved in the significant events of the last days. It's like going to a baseball game and you get the playbook, and in the middle of it is the scorecard. You fill in the lineup card. Who's at first? Who's at second? Who's at short? Who's in left field, center field? Who's pitching? Who's catching? Who are the major players? There are seven of them that are listed in chapters 12 and 13. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman, circle that, clothed with the sun and the moon and the stars. The symbolism here comes right out of Joseph's dream in the book of Genesis as he describes the family of Jacob or Israel. The woman here is not the church. The woman is the mother of Christ. The church is the bride of Christ. She's not the mother of Christ. 
uh, your wife is not your mother, and your mother is not your wife, I hope. They're two separate people. Uh, the mother symbol here is the symbol of the nation of Israel. You say, Ed, well, why is that important? Because at the end of the chapter, in the fifth symbol, it's the remnant of her seed that are persecuted by Satan in the time of the tribulation. It's not the church that's being persecuted by Satan. It's the people of Israel that are being persecuted by Satan in the time of the tribulation. So the symbolism must be consistent throughout the book. The woman with the stars and the moon and the sun is the symbol of the nation of Israel. And then in verse 3, there's a great red dragon, the symbol of Satan. And verse 9 tells you clearly the dragon is the serpent, the devil, and Satan himself. So it's obvious who that symbol is. And then in verse 5, the woman brings forth a male child who is destined to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Well, that's the description of Christ and his millennial reign. But he was caught up to God and to his throne in the ascension. Virtually everybody agrees Christ is the male child. The dragon is the devil. The only debate is over the identity of the woman. He said, well, Ed, why is that important? Because some try to say the woman is the church and that the remnant of her seed who are persecuted then is the church left behind during the tribulation. Well, again, if the church goes through the tribulation period, she's the object of the wrath of Christ and the wrath of God? I don't think so. You say, why are you so convinced that the rapture has to come before the tribulation? Because when Jesus dies on the cross and he stands up on the nails and he pulls himself up on the spikes and he gasps and shouts, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's because the wrath of God fell on him in that moment on the cross. And Jesus took the penalty and the punishment for our sins in that moment. He died in our place on the cross. He took the wrath for us. We're not the objects of the wrath of Christ. The wrath of man, yes. The wrath of Satan, yes. But the wrath of Christ, absolutely not. So you've got Satan the dragon, Jesus the male child, the woman the symbol of Israel. Then in verse 7, the fourth symbol, there was war in heaven and Michael, the archangel, uh, and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels and there was no room found for them and Satan was cast to the earth. You say, well, no, wait, Ed, didn't that happen in eternity past? No, in eternity past, Satan fell from his position but he still has access to the presence of God. In the book of Job, he comes among the angels and argues with God about why he's blessed Job so much. Uh, in this passage, in Revelation 12, verse 10, it says, he's the accuser of the brethren who accuse them day and night before the throne of God. So he still has access to the throne of God, but there will come a time in the future when God the Father will say enough of this and throw him out once and for all, no access. Cast him to the earth where his time is short, not centuries and millennia long, but a short time. Notice it says in verse 13 and 12, the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows his time is short. It's three and a half times, three and a half years at the middle point of the tribulation period. Satan is cast out of heaven permanently, limited to the earth only. So out of anger, he cannot touch the raptured church in heaven. So what does he do? He persecutes the people of God on earth, the people of Israel, those that have come to faith in Christ after the time of the rapture, because the book of Revelation makes it clear thousands of Jewish people will become believers during the time of tribulation and a great host of Gentiles out of every people, tongue, and nation who are saved out of the great tribulation. Satan is angry, persecuting the tribulation saints, persecuting the Jewish believers of the end times, but ultimately they flee into the wilderness Verse 17 says, And the dragon was wroth or angry with a woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, symbol number five in the passage. So the woman is the symbol of Israel. The dragon is the symbol of Satan. The male child is the symbol of Christ. Michael is the archangel. And the remnant of the seed of the woman are the saved Jews of the tribulation period. Satan has been cast out has no more access to the presence of God, and now he's angry. Trust me, you don't want to be left behind. You're under the wrath of the Lamb, 
Christ himself as he opens the seals, and now you're under the wrath of the devil, who at the midpoint of the tribulation period moves the heart then of the Antichrist to break the treaty with Israel, persecute the Jews, drive them out of Jerusalem, to go to the temple of God, showing himself that he is God, and demand that the world worship him. And then you have two more symbols in of chapter 13. The beast out of the sea, the Antichrist, and the beast out of the earth, of the false prophet. Notice 13.1, I stood upon the sand of the sea and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea uh, with the name of blasphemy on his head. And then he describes him as the epitome of a, a leopard and a bear and a lion and a monster. Well, that's the symbolism Daniel uses in his book of the Gentile kingdoms of the future. This is the final epitome of Gentile power all rolled into one, the revival of the ancient Roman Empire, the leader from Europe, a Gentile leader, the Antichrist, who comes to not only oppose the things of Christ, but ultimately dare to say that he is God. Go to the temple of God and demand that he be worshipped as God. And then the seventh symbol in verse 11, behold another beast coming up out of the earth who looked like a lamb, but he spoke like a dragon. He looked religious, but he talked like the devil, and he caused the whole world to worship the first beast, to worship the Antichrist as if he were God. And then he says in verse 16, he caused all, both small and great, rich and poor, bond and free, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. Uh, the word mark is the Greek word in the original text, karagma, a tattoo, a cutting or an engraving in the hand. Is it an implanted computer chip under the skin? I don't know. Uh, is it some kind of insignia on the hand? In this day and age of all kinds of electronic devices with which you can actually buy and make purchases, somebody could steal your phone, make a purchase with it. How are you going to prove it's really your phone? Many have suggested they'll start marking you with a simple tattoo to identify who you are, especially after the rapture, in a time when the world is plunged into chaos uh, and the economy has to be controlled. That's how the Antichrist controls the world, because nobody can buy or sell unless he has the mark of the beast in verse 17. They have to have one of three things, the mark of the beast, the name of the beast, or the number of his name, and the number is 666. It's not simply three sixes. It has to add up to 666. It's for the people who have been left behind in the time of the tribulation to figure out who this is. The speculation about the identity of the Antichrist has gone on for centuries. People said, oh, well, maybe it was Nero. Now you've got to change the spelling of his name to make it work out to add up properly. Or maybe it's Charlemagne or Napoleon or Hitler or Mussolini or maybe it's Stalin or maybe it's some American president of some sort. Uh, nobody ever says it's Joe the plumber. Uh, they always pick some obvious candidate and suggest maybe it's that person or other. Nobody knows. You don't want to know who the Antichrist is. If you figure out who the Antichrist is, you've been left behind. This is for the people that have been left behind to figure out who he is, and he'll be identified by the name and the number that adds up to 666. Seven symbolic players in the great end times drama, the Antichrist and the false prophet, empowered by Satan himself in the great cosmic drama of the end that will eventually lead to Armageddon. Then we'll go to point number six in our outline, and we'll call it the plagues. In chapters 14 to 19, the seven last plagues, the bowls of judgment. Look at chapter 15, verse 1. I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. Now the wrath of God the Father is poured out at the very time of the end. And when that happens, it's all over. It's the other side of the message of the letter, bad news, you lose. The message to the church, good news, we win. But the message to the unbelieving world, bad news, you lose. Once you've gone beyond the point of no return, judgment is irrevocable and judgment will fall at the time of the end. Just as the angels came quickly in staccato fashion to blow the trumpets, so seven more angels come and they pour out the vials or goblets or bowls of the wrath of God. They dip their little bowl into the great bowl of the wrath of God himself who keeps the record of nations and people and knows that judgment is coming. I heard a great voice in verse six, chapter 16, verse 1. I heard a great voice out of the temple 
Say to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. Verse 2, The first angel went and poured his on the earth. In verse 3, The second angel poured his on the sea, and all of it was polluted. Verse 4, The third angel poured his on the rivers, and they were like blood, and they were polluted. Verse 8, The fourth angel poured his on the sun, and the power of the sun began to scorch people as though the ozone layer has been burned away. Now notice something. The bowl judgments land on the same objects as the trumpet judgments. Only in the trumpet judgments, a third of the world was affected. In the bowl judgments, all of the world is affected. The world is out of control. Mankind is about to literally destroy himself. God must intervene. And then the fifth angel in verse 10 pours his bowl of judgment on the kingdom of the beast and plunges it into darkness and they blasphemed God and they repented not. They don't want to take your chances of being left behind and say, well, if the rapture occurs, then I'll get saved. These people don't. The rapture's already occurred. They still do not repent. They shake their fist in the face of God and say, in essence, we will never surrender to you. Then in verse 12, the sixth angel poured his bowl of judgment on the great river Euphrates, and the water was dried up. Well, that's never happened before. To prepare the way of the kings of the east, where are they going? In verse 14, to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. What is that battle? Revelation 16, 16, and he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. There it is the only place in the Bible where that word appears. You might underline it or circle it in your Bible. Everybody talks about it. Is the battle of Armageddon coming? Well, it's not coming till after the rapture, till after the time of tribulation, but the years of tribulation will culminate in the battle of Armageddon as the nations of the world are led by the Antichrist into the valley of Jezreel at Armageddon, uh, at that broad, flat place in Israel, the greatest natural battlefield in the Middle East where more blood has been shed throughout history than any other place on the planet. The final conflict is about to come there. Then in chapter 17 and 18, you have the fall of Babylon, the kingdom of the Antichrist. You have the pouring out of the seventh bowl into the air. And there came a great voice out of the temple from the throne. It's the voice of God the Father saying, it is done. Have you ever wondered, I'd like to study the book of Revelation, but I'm kind of afraid of it. I mean, people have told me it's so complicated, it's so difficult. The third horn of the second toe of the fourth beast, or what's that all about? How am I supposed to understand the symbolic and cryptic language of the book? Well, let me remind you, the Bible is written so that you and I can understand it. Prophecy is not written to scare us, it's written to prepare us. So what we've done is we've prepared an entire study of the book of Revelation in just one hour. Give me an hour of your time, I can teach you the whole book of Revelation. We'll summarize it in seven basic points. We'll look at what it's all about, what it's telling us about the future, about judgments to come, and about the promise of the Lord to come for us before the time of judgment. We'll go to the island of Patmos. We'll go to the seven churches of the Revelation. We'll even go to the Valley of Armageddon. We'll go on site. We'll summarize it in the DVD also in printed form in the booklet. You can get both right now. Let me teach you the book of Revelation. Jesus said, preach this in the churches. He means for us to understand it, apply it, and live it to the glory of God. Unfortunately, it's impossible to squeeze an hour-long message into half an hour, but you can have every bit of Dr. Heinsohn's exciting message by obtaining a copy of Understanding Revelation in one hour. To receive your copy, make a gift of $30 or more payable to The King is Coming, Box 907, Colton, California, 92324. To use your credit card, call 800-622-2767 or go to thekingiscoming.com.